on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. What we are asking is not for people to give us money. We're actually offering them a way of pre-ordering our books that include all kinds of interesting ancillary uh, goodies that they might get if we reach certain st stretch goals. And that's the real secret of, of Kickstarter. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with James Blatch. And Mark Dawson. And we are both representing today, aren't we? We are, yes. We, I'm, I was in a shirt this morning. I was playing football with my son and he ripped the shirt right down the middle. Um, so yeah. I... Um, was that he's, looking? He's very sweet. Is it? It's a very old shirt. And he said, um, I said, I'm just going to throw it away. He said, don't throw it away, Daddy. You look good in it. Oh, very much. So, that's very sweet. sweet. But no, I've, I'm wearing uh, I'm, I'm wearing my own brand today, which is, is a Sounded bit like it meta. could have been a yellow card. Uh, I think it's a red card, basically. Yeah, red card, kind of, yeah, he's uh, off. kind of behavior. He's, he's straight off. He's straight off. Okay, yes. Uh, well, we should say about our merch that um, Amazon is, uh, in fact, this will bring us neatly onto one of our first topics of conversation today, that Amazon is struggling to get a merch done in the United States as we speak with the COVID-19 situation. They are, I think, still operating, albeit with delays in the UK, um, but you'll have to bear with us if you're after that. Very nice T-shirt. Uh, time uh, will pass before you'll be able to order again in the US. We'll try and update our, the merch tab on our website with that. That uh, sort of brings us on to a, a topic that's been hot in the uh, in our Facebook groups and other Facebook groups this week, which is Amazon has been a, a tad glitchy over the last three or four days. Go home, Amazon, you're drunk. Uh, this started, I think, about four days ago or five days ago where somebody posted into, I think, the 20 Books group and said, hey, um, has anybody else found their book going to zero? I've just seen it's been given away for free and I didn't change it to zero. And that started a lot of other people saying, oh, yeah, this has happened to me. And it looked to me, Mark, reading the messages as if it was affecting people who'd made some changes to their book in the KDP dashboard. Mm. And as See, in, even uncommanded change added into that was it went to zero. It, yeah, it seemed that way. I, I, it didn't affect me, so I can't comment on that one. Although I've had my own issues with Amazon this week, but it, it did. Um, it was it wasn't isolated. There were quite a few people who um, saw their 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 book went to zero. I think pre orders as well were going to zero. So a lot of people were, were worried. Um, you know, were they going to lose money? And I haven't spoken to Amazon about this, but I, I would be. You know, I, I wouldn't worry too much. I'd be very, very surprised if, well, first of all, I, I, they know, I believe they know it's an issue. Um, and I'd be very surprised if when they fixed it, that it doesn't, um, it doesn't mean that those, those sales that should have happened will be credited at, at the price they're supposed to be credited at. So I, I wouldn't worry too much. Frustrating isn't and it, a bit worrying sometimes. A, but a, a difficulty with that though, because let's say you, I suppose they could use averages, couldn't the part, let's say you sell, 25 books a day on average and you you push out 250 when it's marked to free for two days yeah that's true i mean i i just think they i mean you could argue they just have to run all of those um because those books were were downloaded at a price that they set or that you had but you hadn't changed the list price i don't mm. really know i mean i'm not gonna i'm not thinking about that in terms kinds of in legal terms but i i suspect amazon will do the right thing on, on that and, and that will all get um s sorted out Otherwise, you'll underwrite it. You're, yeah, that's right. Personally, yeah, pay I, I everybody will. Yeah. for any losses no, incurred. Been, there have been a few issues. So I've um, I, others may have noticed this too. I've I've got a pre-order coming up, um, and I changed the blurb. So I had a kind of a placeholder blurb, which I wanted to change for the real thing, and I did it as we record this on Monday the fourth, uh, May the fourth, Happy Star Wars Day. Um, hmm. The um, yeah, it's been four days, I think, and it's just stuck in review. It's really annoying. Um, also, there's a, a the print version of this book that's coming out whenever I can has been stuck in review for about the same time. And I've got a book bub on Thursday, no, Wednesday on the 6th. And I changed the price on Saturday and that's still in review. So the, the, the uh, review process is basically broken at the moment. Um, let me just no, say that um, 
Uh, this this has come on quite quickly because I did some changes, new cover, new blurb to one of our books in Fuse. Must have been Monday or Tuesday last week, and that went through absolutely fine very quickly. I, mean, I think I got the approval the next day, which is about right. Uh, but suddenly, Friday or something like that last week, it all started becoming glitchy. So something, someone's, some cleaner somewhere has unplugged a computer to put their, their vacuum cleaner something. in. Something like that. So yes, I do have a pre-order coming up, and I want that to go live this week if I can, um, because I think yeah. that'll be best for the launch. And this is a Milton wanna, book. But... It is a Milton book. Yes, seventeenth. So I've got this um, the sixteenth. Sixteenth. Sixteenth Milton book. Yeah. So it's people really want want it. The um, advanced readers have been really positive, which is always lovely. Um, so it's ready to go, pretty much. The manuscript is done. The vellum is done. Uh, everything is ready. Um, but. I, it's you know, and I, I set the pre-order date a year in advance, so it's I set it in September last year. So I've got until this September, but I'm ready to go now. Um, and um, so I'm just waiting for this blurb to be approved. And of course, once that's approved, I'll then have to upload the the, the correct manuscript um, and then click, uh, you know, get it approved again. So it's entirely possible that this won't be approved for another day or two. I'll then have mm. another four days to wait whilst, you know, we're going to be into next week before before we know it. So I I may have I've dropped an email to some Amazonians who I think might be able to help. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to give it a kick, switch it on and switch it off again, always the best yeah, policy. Yeah, exactly. And, and just so I understand how we understand how this works, the pre-order, you get a year. Dur- during that year, I think they've done some extensions actually because of COVID, but anyway, during that year, you've got to make the book live at some point in those 12 months. But the date, sort of the year point, do, uh, when you put your book up for pre-order, do you put a date, f- public facing date of the date it's going you to do. go live? Yeah, so on the website, it says September 2020. Um, and you chose and that, and that, that, that was the maximum length you could have had mm. under the Amazon rules, and you chose that yes, date. Yes, I knew it. I knew it would be ready in advance of that, um, but I wanted to run the pre-orders. But I, I you know, I, so I could just hoover up sales, and you know, thirteen thousand pre-orders is pretty healthy. Um, but yeah, I knew I knew there'd be no pressure in having that out there. I could have I could have set a date six months from you know when I put it up for pre-order, but that would have put me under a little bit of pressure that wasn't necessary. So I just like it to be as long as possible, so I can then push the button when I'm ready to go, knowing that there's no no possibility that I'll miss the backstop date. The only issue with that is that the date is on Amazon and I've had lots of readers, um, when I say to them in emails that the book will be out next week, they'll go, I've just been to Amazon and it says September 2020. Even though I've got uh, in the in the email, I said, ignore that date. And even on, on mm-hmm. the actual Amazon page, it says this date is wrong. They they still don't see that sometimes. And, um, yeah, so, and that, so I've that, had to be dealing is, with that. That is a slight downside of doing it that way because readers will always see that date very 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 small i mean yeah. Yeah, you can it's easy to correct just yeah. email back and say don't worry amazon's wrong i'm right yes. it'll be out next week well hopefully about this this week we'll see good and i haven't seen anything today i haven't had a chance to look in the forums today but um to see what the situation is but your understanding is on on as it is may the 4th be with you day um that amazon is still glitchy well, I only in in as far as I can comment on my own experience, and those books haven't been approved yet. So yes, there seems to be slow. So if you've got a book bub coming up, I change the price as, as soon as you can. Yes. Yeah. At the moment, I'm not entirely sure it'll, it'll be ready when when the book bub live goes live on uh, on the sixth. Well, you won't be the only person in that position, so I'm sure they won't. They'll be they'll be easy on you at uh, Boston Towers. But, no, they won't. Yeah. They'll, uh, they'll jump on me. <laughs> How are you? We'll, we'll see. We'll um, see. Yeah, it, do you know what this sort of thing happens from time to time? And it happens more in a complex online environment than it used to happen in bookshops. Well, I'm quite certain they shipped 25,000 books of uh, somebody's autobiography in the 1980s and priced them up wrong uh, in the shops for two weeks before anyone noticed. It's the sort of thing that does happen from time to time when we have to um, uh, make some allowances. Okay, right. Um, we are going to have a quick chat about the Amazon ads course. And the reason for that is that I'm really heads down editing it this morning. I've been going through the uh, the modules and the sessions. It's shaping up to be, it's structured in a slightly different way from most of our courses, shorter sessions and more of them. But it's a really, really good course. And as somebody who's now running Amazon ads in anger for our Fuse Books series, oh God. Uh, I'm starting to um, really lap it up. Uh, I'm really excited about this course. So Janet Margot, just to remind people, we've recruited Janet Margot's 
straight from Amazon. She was at the coalface, the person helping to design this very platform. She's now moved to another part of the vast Amazon empire, which leaves her free to be the tutor for you, to teach you how to use this platform that she had a hand in, in creating. Um, and it's exciting. It's shaping up very nicely. We're going to have it ready for June. I'm pretty certain about that now, which is the late uh, the date we've got in mind for opening up ads for authors at the very beginning of June. Um, yeah, and you're, I know you're keeping an eye across it as well. Mark, I see your comments in the vast spreadsheet we have, which is the production side of bringing a course to, to fruition. There's a few notes from you going back with uh, some extra examples, our, using our experience of putting courses together and helping Janet with that side of it. Yes, yeah. So Janet has, you know, Janet knows as much as anybody in the world about Amazon ads for authors because she was that's what she did. She she set up the the books program in in Amazon um, advertising. So she's very knowledgeable. Um, and so you combine that with with our um, expertise when it comes to making courses look look swish plus of course I'll, I'll be i'll be doing some um, stuff in the course as well so things like keyword research that's something that I'm, I'm quite good at so we'll we'll have some sessions with me but it'll be mostly with janet um and yeah it's, it's going to be really good i mean we've said before anyone who's already uh, a, a member of the ads for authors course will get that or that you'll just see that that will appear um in your teachable school and it will be something that we'll be offering as a part of the um the new course when it goes live in in june so it definitely um I mean, it's, it's, we're, I'm pretty excited. I mean, I'm excited about it. Because I think Janet will show me things I didn't. I didn't know. So, yeah, um, be very good. And one of the things that we've got is a webinar coming up. So we'll be doing some webinars during the launch period, and Janet is doing one for us. Um, it's on Tuesday, the 9th of June. It's at Lon London time, 9 p.m. New York time, 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, 1 p.m. Um, and uh, we will be looking at six uh, six. Six, 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 six. six. I can't, I can't that could have come out worse. Secrets could have done. Yes, yeah. six secrets to Amazon ad success. Um, so with me and Janet, hosted by your good self, uh, and we're going to be looking at um, uh, how to how to start off small and scale up effectively. Whether ad relevance or the highest bid is more important. Um, how to develop key learnings. I hate that word. Key learnings. It's almost like journey um, on what works for your books. And that simplicity is often key to a successful Amazon ad. And there'll be a Q&A at the end. Um, so it'll be basically me, Janet, and James. So you'll be able to ask us about Amazon ads, Facebook ads for me, um, anything else really. Um, and you can ask James. I'm not sure. I'm sure James can ask, answer some questions about some things. Not quite sure what. Think I, about I, that. Um, I can tell you I'm showing a profit on my Amazon ads. So I'm pretty much correct that. <laughs> very good <laughs> um yeah so it's going to be good and the um what do we say the uh, url was going to be it's going to be six secrets so selfpublishingformula.com forward slash six secrets s-i-x s-e-c-r-e-t-s not to be confused with selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sex secrets which is john's personal uh, page don't go there <laughs> uh selfpublishingformula.com yes, no, definitely don't go there forward slash six secrets all one word. We'll probably put the Digit 6 version out there as well, just to... Yes. Uh, and that'll be a place where you can sign up for the webinar. Uh, completely free, of course, uh, as Mark says, June the 9th. But get in early. We've got a 1,000 spots uh, available because that's our limit on our go-to webinar account. And it would not surprise me uh, if this is the uh, the webinar that busts that top limit. Well, we've already, we've already done that once. We, we have yeah. had a, a webinar that was full once, so this one definitely will be full. Um, there's, I don't think there's any question about that. So, And just to explain how um, that we'll, works, you can, you can register. In fact, we can register mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of people. It's a limit on attendees. So basically, it's getting in early, uh, getting there. A few, if you get there on time or a few minutes before, in the past, you've always been guaranteed a slot. It's the last 10 minutes once we've started normally where it fills up and goes over the top. But... We had a few people sending us um, angry um, emails with screen grabs of a little go to webinar dialogue box that said this webinar is full. So yeah. it, we're not, it, this isn't us, you know, it's not BS. No. It, we can't, it's a thousand people and that is, that's the limit that we have. So um, yeah, definitely register and then make sure that you are there, it, you know, a quarter, to, quarter to nine UK time um, on the 9th. So yes, we're looking forward to that one. Okay, right, look, let's move on to today's interview. It's with a man called Nicholas Kotar, a very interesting guy. He's a first-generation Russian uh, immigrant, immigrant family in the US, and he uh, wears his heritage very proudly, but he is also a very... Um, 
uh, entrepreneurial guy, uh, very motivated, and he's somebody who has used crowdfunding to fund his fiction book. Now, this is something that does take place from time to time. More often, I would say, with non-fiction, certainly non-fiction project products. But it can work for fiction, but it works in a particular way. And Nick uh, has really uh, laid that open for us in this interview, really gone into detail. It's another way of doing things. It's a way of building uh, a fan base at the same time as writing the book, really super fans who feel invested in your book and of making the book profitable right from the start, a bit like pre-orders. So let's, uh, let's hear from Nick and then Mark and I can have a quick chat off the back of that. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Nick, hello, and welcome to the self-publishing show. Oh, that was an extreme close-up. Um, that was. <laughs> Sorry. Do you, remember, do you remember Wayne's World? They used to do that extreme close-up. Yes, exactly. Um, that was what that was. Uh, okay, well, that's a good way to say hello. We should um, we should do a formal <laughs> welcome then to the show, and you're joining us from. Oh, remind me where you're in the US somewhere. Yeah, I call it cow country because that's about as cl- as close as anybody knows. It's near Cooperstown, uh, New York, which is known only for its uh, for the fact of its being the Baseball Hall of Fame. But other than ah, that, nobody knows where it yes. is. So. And the, uh, I must go there one day. The whole town's built around the uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Good. Okay. Well, well, there's a trip for me one day when uh, when the travel restrictions eventually get lifted. From oh, good grief! Yeah, recording absolutely. this in the middle of it all, but uh, hopefully by the time yep. this goes out, maybe things have settled down. Okay, yeah. now we're going to talk a, a bit about you, but a bit about an unusual approach to funding your writing career, which is, uh, I think, what we're going to get some instruction about. But let's start with yep. you, Nick, uh, an interesting career. You're multi-talented. You're a bit of a renaissance <laughs> man. Uh, that's what I try, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell us yeah. about you. Well, I've been writing, as many people probably say on this show, uh, for you know since I was a kid. But um but in terms of actually writing for a living, um, it's been a very long and kind of convoluted uh, journey. Um, currently, I consider myself to be a full-time creative, but it's from a wide variety of different sources. I translate from Russian to English. I write fiction. I speak. Uh, I give online workshops. I sing professionally. Um, wow. And uh, yeah, and I conduct a men's choir um, for which I receive not that much money, but I, I kind of see that as my, uh, as the center of my creative life uh, on a regular basis. And um, yeah, I'm sure there's a few more things that I'm forgetting. At, yeah. At the did moment, you mention your translation? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. Did, okay. I, I translate from Russian to English. Yeah. Yeah. Which is amazing. Uh, so you see so you're fluent in Russian, I presume. It was actually my first language, even though I was born in San Francisco, uh, I spoke nothing but Russian until I was five. Wow. Uh, there's, there's a story there. My, my parents come from immigrant stock my grandparents had to had to immigrate from russia after the revolution and they felt very strongly about uh keeping the culture and the language intact uh, especially in america where people tend to lose that very quickly um so and i'm doing that with my kids now too my uh my three kids speak only russian (laughs) they speak only russian well my my eldest is starting to catch up on the english because it you know it happens very quickly um it's much easier to lose the russian than it is to uh to gain Wow, English, that must be so. that must be quite something. Yeah, I've got friends who are bilingual, <laughs> and they do yeah. something where they'll speak one language at home. Usually, the the language of the country they're not in. So, if their English family yeah. in, in yeah. France, they speak English in the house, and then French yeah. outside it, something like that. So, yeah, that's a really good thing to do. I mean, I, you know, I'm a lazy Englishman, so I obviously only barely <laughs> speak English. But what a great advantage for a child to grow up with it being bilingual. It doesn't matter what the other language is, actually. Yeah. I think that's, that's true. I think that's great. Okay, well, look. Um, Let's talk a bit about your writing then. So I think it's it's fairy tales. Is that what well, that's at least one of your specialist areas and perhaps fantasy is your... Yeah, it's I'm sort of between genres. I think uh, technically speaking, what I write is fantasy, but uh, practically speaking, I take a lot of inspiration from Russian fairy tales and the way I structure my stories is very much along fairy tale, traditional fairy tale structures. And oftentimes I get uh, story elements or plot elements or characters from uh, from old from the old Russian fairy tales, and I think there's a lot of actually um, there's a lot of good crossover between the two genres. But I technically speaking, if we're talking about Amazon um, uh, genres, I don't think I fit exactly into the fairy tale one because usually what sells in the fairy tale uh, section is happily ever after retellings of a Cinderella tale, and oftentimes they'll have. Uh, a princess in a ball gown as the cover. And that's sort of what people look for when they go to the fairy tale section. So technically I'm close, I skew closer to the epic fantasy scale of things. Okay. I guess in their origins, they're both, I mean, one of the great things about fairy tales is they're quite sinister. 
Um, and when you're a kid, oh, I think yeah. you're quite drawn oh, to yeah. that dark side of poisoning young, beautiful women, all, all the things that happen <laughs> yeah. in fairy tales. It's quite, well, I mean, you use the word grim, of course, the Grimm brothers, but the, um, they were yep. quite grim. And they've been used a lot in more modern terms in comic books and retellings, dark retellings. There was quite a violent, handsome Gretel not that long ago. Um, oh, so, yeah. yeah, yes, I can see that the epic fantasy has, I can see where the origins work, work for both. But um, yeah. Yeah, because of that child's connection and epic yep. fantasy. Is this is this, this conform to um, to genre in that quite long books? They're actually not, and this is the one uh, the one aspect where I kind of uh, go countercultural. They they're pretty self contained. I think for most people who look for the doorstopper experience of of the extremely rich world building, that's not quite what I do. I like a lot more streamlined kind of a uh, approach to um, to the plot, where the world building happens a little more naturally as the characters go through the world. And I don't, um, to be honest, and maybe I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, I kind of get annoyed with the really, really long um, epic fantasy <laughs> um, because oftentimes it's just world building for world building's sake. Uh, and, you know, we really don't have all that many hours in a given day and there's so many books out there. You know, I'd yeah. rather get to the story more quickly. So now I've been mulling that question today, actually, because I've been thinking of through a sort of science fiction ideas yeah. that I've been having some, sort of in between ideas at the moment and okay. <laughs> um I, I i often mention ian m banks because i love his science fiction writing and what what i think he does with science fiction is he doesn't spend any world building time the world building yeah. is all incidental you learn it through yeah. the story and it's a normal size book and a normal size story but you can do the opposite of that you can spend a lot of time because you think well people don't understand how the society works here so i have to explain that but that's much more interesting when that's yeah. incidental to the story that's what I think, but I do I do recognize that a lot of epic fantasy readers read epic fantasy specifically for those asides. Um, I'm just not one of them. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about this fundraising um, scheme that you had. So, when did you decide to to do that? So, I mean, as as with so many things with the writer's career, uh, this one is almost a story in itself. Um, you know, I'm a I'm a dedicated follower of this podcast of Joanna Penn's podcast and a lot of the other sort of sh sh bright and shining lights in the indie movement. Um, the reason I'm indie is another story, but we're not going to get into that. Um, but uh, so I try, I tried a lot of different things. I'm only about three years into this uh, as an indie. So it's pretty, pretty early days, so to speak. And I, I put my hand into every single pie that I could, especially initially, um, just to see what worked and what didn't. And there was one, I was involved with Insta Freebie, Insta Freebie while they were still Insta Freebie. And they had this strange um, email that came out, and I'm not sure that everybody got it. I think it was to a small subset of their of their people that basically said, "Would you be interested in a pilot uh, course for crowdfunding for fiction specifically? Uh, and if you'd be interested, would you would you take a course with us?" Right. And so I kind of just filled it out, thought, yeah, "Nothing's going to happen." And a few weeks later, I was one of 15 people uh, chosen for their pilot crowdfunding course. And it was done in total secrecy. Nobody knew about it. It was a kind of uh, a, their attempt to make this into something that I think would become profitable for them at some point. So I was in at the ground level with uh, an author, Jay Swanson. That's okay, it, Jay, Jay Swanson. Swanson, yeah. Yeah, he's a, he had done a few uh, crowdfunding uh, things, and so he was pretty good at it. But none of us really knew what to expect because it was a first-time thing, and there was a lot of negative press surrounding crowdfunding as an approach for marketing for uh, for fiction specifically and pretty much anybody you would talk to would tell you don't even try um, because it only works for nonfiction. that was sort of the the party line that everybody was was uh, was spreading around but because it was offered and because it was free i thought well why not and um so that's how i got it got into it uh it ended up being um very successful so we can get into the details of, of how that happened yeah well I, i'm interested in that because i think people would think of it for non-fiction uh, for yeah. obvious reasons particularly non-fiction genre you know areas that are going to potentially reward the person investing you know right uh, by learning something that's going to enhance their career and when we think yeah. of crowdfunding for fiction and creative stuff it's normally lower level like um yeah. patreon uh, is an example isn't it etsy and so on so um yeah but you did take this to the next go now how, how did you set about what, what did you what was the offer well that's that's the interesting thing so the the first thing that we had to understand from the very beginning is we had to unlearn a, a bunch of things that we thought we understood about crowdfunding fiction specifically. 
because so many people equate uh, crowdfunding with charity, um, specifically because of GoFundMe and other such platforms that oftentimes are set up for people in tragic circumstances. Kickstarter specifically, and it wasn't just crowdfunding, it was Kickstarter specifically, is a different platform entirely because it has its own uh, sort of social aspect. A lot of people go to Kickstarter specifically for everything that they need whether it's practical things, whether it's interesting new ideas, whether it's books, as it turns out. So it, the, the thing we all had to understand from the very beginning was that what we are asking is not for people to give us money. We're actually offering them a way of pre-ordering our books that include all kinds of interesting ancillary uh, goodies that they might get if we reach certain st stretch goals. And that's the real secret of, of Kickstarter, as it turns out, is that it's not merely a platform for uh, to get money from people who are interested in buying your books. It's a platform for that, but it's also a platform for people who like the community building aspect of, of reading and of storytelling. So if you are then, as I was, able to frame the whole ask in a way that emphasized the community story building aspect of it, um, there's a real response to it. Uh, it was it was quite shocking, actually. I ended up uh, overfunding by a lot. <laughs> wow. So, so how, how did you set it out? What were the extra sort of community goodies that you got? Well, I started out by, by making sure uh, in the video that I did, and by the way, the video is very important. We can talk more about the video later, about the specifics of it. But I made sure to uh, focus on the reader, not on me. And this is the real thing that a lot of people don't think about. It's not about me. It's not about me as the author. I don't, I don't need your help. You need my help, actually. And so this is, this is how you're, you, you have to find an angle in which, the, in which you look at the journey of the reader as a kind of hero's journey. So the hero who is the reader has a problem. And that problem can actually be answered very easily with fiction. Uh, we just don't think of it in those terms. Most of the time, it's a matter of entertainment. But I did it a little bit differently. I decided that I would focus on uh, an ask that I was sure nobody else was doing. And that was, how would you like to participate in the creation of a story at the very beginning? How would you like to be one of the people who actually have input into the directions that the characters go, into the names that they get, into the uh, you know, mythical creatures that I choose? Um, and that ask was the entry point. So it was interesting and different enough, and people automatically recognized that I wasn't asking them for money, that I was offering them an experience. And so that's what got them past my video and into the actual sales page. And then when they got to the sales page, that's when I hooked them because I included some pretty insane <laughs> uh, goodies. Um, I gave them the option of uh, entering at a certain at a certain tier level. They were automatically entered into a drawing where they would win a custom-made, uh, personally forged sword. Uh, that was worth over two thousand dollars. <laughs> wow! Yeah, and I had a uh, um, there was a few other things, including a a, a little uh, stone carving of one of the characters in the novel that was done by an actual stone carver that was also uh, given free to one of the people who entered at a certain tier level. So there were two giveaways that were automatically for free. I also uh, one of the stretch goals in included audiobooks. Um, which a lot of people I know contributed specifically because of that, because they wanted to see the audiobooks made, as well as hardcovers, which also interested some people because it's not very often that independent publishers actually go the route of the hardcover. So, so those were those were things that helped. But ultimately, I think what really um, ensured the success of the project was the fact that I had really good covers, that I had really good copy, and that I emphasized again and again the community building aspect of it and reinforced it at every single uh, tier. So it was, it was like I was leading them through a long story. Like my sales page was actually a story and, the, and they were the heroes in the story, not me. Um, and that's hard to do in a crowdfunding uh, mm. context because you're inevitably, inevitably going to think of yourself as the hero because you you want to win but it's not you're not the hero they're the hero and, and you have to and it's hard to do that because at some point you have to actually include your your own struggles in as part of the ask so at some point you do have to give the ask it's not entirely about them it's about us but if you can manage to make it about us 
then there's more likelihood that, that people are interested. So this this unfolded on the sales page with the with the sort of stretch points you call them uh, as as opt ins at various points of this story of how far you wanted to go. So the way that the stretch goals work on Kickstarter specifically is, uh, if you reach a certain financial goal above your minimum, then automatically uh, those goals come into effect. So um, you know, I, I was funding at seven and a half thousand dollars. And if you reach 10,000, then, then one thing happens automatically. And if you reach 15, another thing happened automatically 20 and so on. And um, so that provides it also with a kind of entertainment aspect, because if you're invested in it, you want to see yeah. how far it can go, especially if you're one of the backers and there's a chance you're going to get an audiobook version of all five books. And it was a five book series. Um, also, what helped was that I had uh, two of the books, three of the books already written to, and two of them published. So I was able to show the people a track record of success because there is some uh, negative press around fiction Kickstarters in that there is a fairly frequent, I don't have any numbers, but there is this kind of, in the zeitgeist, there's this understanding that some authors don't fulfill their promises right. even after they've, Which is even after they've funded. Which a big no-no. Yeah, yeah. And you have to, so basically you have to, there's a lot of objections that you have to overcome yeah. on the part of the, uh, of the reader. Uh, but if you're able to do that, they're willing to help you, honestly. It's interesting. Yeah. And uh, the good thing about that particular methodology is that the people who've backed you and want want to see the goals achieved for their own gain are going to be your ambassadors, aren't they? They're going to sell the sell the uh, project to other people. And and what's interesting is is that they're actually a community in and of themselves, a community that doesn't generally buy books on Amazon, that doesn't generally buy books in other places. So it's another niche, it's another community that you can build. And if you sustain it well, uh, they will be interested in what you do for the long term. Um, so it's not merely for this one project, you can actually carry them on to become either your subscribers or your Patreon uh, supporters or other things. Uh, and th it's a fairly easy ask because if, you give, if you've given them all these things, uh, men, much of which is actually free, um, and that also depends on how you how you do the tiers. You have to make sure that you're you're uh, giving people value for the money. Um, but if you do, uh, they'll be willing to follow you for a long time. Yeah. So let's get some details here. How much did you ask for the various uh, points and offers, and how much did you raise? Well, I raised over twenty five thousand dollars. I was I intended to raise seven and a half, and I raised over twenty five thousand. Um, I was completely flabbergasted <laughs> by it. <laughs> I didn't expect it to happen at all. In fact, the seven and a half thousand ask was rather high. Um, and uh, the people that were uh, the the people that were in the course, most most of them had a much lower ask. And it was a bit of a risk. Um, but because of those things, I ended up uh, overfunding much more. And I think the the key to why I overfunded as much as I did was in addition to all the other things that I said, was actually something that you don't often see in fiction Kickstarters. And that's that I, I was very careful about uh, pricing my books correctly. Because if you, if you look at, and if you do some research on fiction Kickstarters that are out there, very often they'll offer an ebook version of the, of the book that they're trying to fundraise for, for something like 10 or $15 right. and the paperback version for 25, 30. The, the simple fact of that, is that that's not much of an incentive for a pre-order because they can just wait for the book to be published and buy it on Amazon for much less. Um, and that's, even if they don't end up buying it on Amazon, that's their thought process automatically. And the, you know, in all honesty, right now, people are looking for good deals more than anything. And the reality of the coronavirus is only gonna make that even worse. So I was very careful about pricing my eBooks at about the same level as they would be on Amazon. So it's a much lower ask than most people would do for an ebook, but I did it on purpose. But the, so, but I also what I made sure to do was I made sure in my in my video to specifically direct them not to the lowest tier. So in my call to action in the video, I made sure to direct them to the best deal that I had, which was all five of my ebooks for twenty dollars. Uh, which is a really good deal. It's it's a lot less than it would be if you bought them in, individually on Amazon. So it's not even the same amount as it would be on Amazon. It's a significant um, uh, discount. So and I directed them to that. And in the process of directing them to that tier, the next tier that I had that was really popular was actually the hundred dollar tier, which was all of my paperbacks signed 
all five of them for a hundred dollars, which is again, a lot less than you would pay for wow. five paperbacks. Yeah. And I had a lot of a hundred dollar um, backers as they're called, they're called backers on Kickstarter. And what I did to make sure that more people went to the hundred dollar one is that I made the hundred dollar and up an automatic entry for the sword. And I'm, I'm completely convinced that the sword did most of my work for me <laughs> because I, I included actual pictures from uh, the work of the of the forger, who's a Canadian, a really great guy named Je- Jeff Helms. He's a fantastic, fantastic forger, uh, a swordsmith, I guess you'd call him. Mm. And just to have the pictures out there in the sales page, I mean, they're impressive. And, and you know, you could win this for free and it's only $100. So, you know, why not? And uh, that, that ended up working in my favor. <laughs> and did you... Um... Uh, did you get a couple of these? I'm assuming they'd be made out of beryllium steel. Is that what they had in Game of Thrones? Beryllium steel. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> is, did you get a couple of these made? So you've got one. Uh, I don't. Can you imagine? Wow. You just had this <laughs> yeah. one, and it's it's as it yeah. now it's presumably now gone out. Yeah, yeah, it's gone. I don't have it. <laughs> so I I was willing to to give up to give it up to somebody else because you know to make two or three it would have been it would have been prohibitively expensive so what's interesting about this to me is the way you're describing it is it's not so much uh setting up the you know a good sales page and the, the mechanics of it and, and what the price points it's it's about this story this narrative this thing this event that people were happy yeah. to be a part of that's what seemed to have made it work well that's that's the entry point right so if you can catch people's attention with with a good narrative, then they're willing to cut you some slack. But that being said, if you then provide them with a sales page that's sloppy or with tiers of, of support that are not a good enough value, they're not going to last very long. They might get to the bottom of the sales page and then decide, yeah, I kind of like what he's doing, but I'll just wait for the book to be published. It's safer that way. Yeah, um, you're, yeah you're dealing with a lot of object- objections and you have to take care of all of them. So it means having very good covers. Um, you know, my, my, uh, my, I guess you would, you would call it a, I don't know what they would call it, but basically the photo that opened my page, it was like the, the title photo and you clicked on it. Then the video started was three of my, um, covers, which were designed by Stuart Bache of all people, of course, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, who had not done fantasy at, uh, up to that point. So th- this was a kind of entry, an interesting experiment for him as well, but they were fantastic, obviously. Uh, and they grabbed people's attention immediately. Then the story was good. And then I just took them through this story. I, and at every point I made sure to, to tell them this is a, to show them rather than tell them that this is actually a very good deal. And this is something you're not going to get anywhere else. And the, the subject matter, the fact that it was Slavic fantasy uh, was different and appealing enough for people to s- stick with me longer. Yeah. Um, well, we're going to have to look up these covers now. And, uh, and so you could just give <laughs> us the title and, and pen name of the book so people can look that up whilst we're talking. The the series is called the Raven Sun series, uh, and the first the first novel is the Song of the Siren. Uh, that's spelled S I R I N. Okay, so I've just got just got the uh, the books up um, on the screen here, and having a look at them, yeah, fantastic uh, covers, very striking. Um, okay, so you'd written two. It was a five book series. That's what the your, the, the project was funding. The Kickstarter was funding. Yeah. You'd yeah. written a couple, but hadn't published. Is that right? I'd published the first two. Okay, the first and, two were published. The, yeah, and the third was was finished, but it wasn't published yet. So they they had an immediate incentive to support me because as soon as they would, they would receive book three, which was just about to be published. Okay. So there was also there was also that kind of limited time offer aspect of it. it and it wasn't just you know fund me for the future and someday I'll get you the book. It was I will get you a book now. In fact, I'll give you three of them. <laughs> yeah. So so people who did the the hundred dollars this the the signed hardback copies is that right or signed. Signed paperback. Signed paperback copies. You, they got the first three almost straight away. Yeah, yeah. And then they waited for the next two. And have you done the next two now? Well, I'm almost done with book five. So okay. it, it, this this is my one the one minus for for all of this is that I I uh, I wasn't realistic with my uh, with how fast I could finish it. So I'm about a year behind. Okay. But but to be honest, uh, because I gave them so much value so early on, I've had almost. I think I've had one person complaining and the rest of them just occasionally write me an email saying, I love your books. When is the fifth one coming out? Yeah. Not that I'm pushing you. They're saying, I'm not pushing yeah, yeah. you. Just, <laughs> I, I'm just curious to know. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's been a, a very positive experience overall. Okay. So did it have a knock on effect to sales outside the Kickstarter once they were published? Well, not immediately. And this is what's interesting is that I, I was, the way I looked at it, 
was this was an opportunity because I had so much more money than I anticipated. It was an opportunity for me to uh, buy a lot of educational materials and to start saving up money for um, for the future. So I didn't expect it to have an immediate effect on sales because the difference between a Kickstarter buyer and a buyer on Amazon is quite significant. And none of those sales on uh, on Kickstarter are reflected on any um, list. So even though I sold over 5,000 books just on the Kickstarter, um, none of those 5,000 ever ref- were ever reflected on an, in an Amazon algorithm or in any other algorithm. So that's the one kind of reality that you have to be aware of mm-hmm. is that it doesn't, it won't immediately have an effect on your sales ranking on other on other retailers. That's just not realistic. But what I did is I bought a bunch of courses. I bought uh, Brian Cohen's course. I, I bought Mark's ad course. And I started to slowly uh, take care of the fundamentals, the, the foundational stuff, so that when um, when I was able to publish book four, I saw a significant uh, increase in my in my um, income for every month. And it's continuing to go up uh, because I, I was careful about not sort of throwing all my eggs into one basket, but to do this more steadily. And I'm a wide author. I'm not somebody who does uh, Kindle Unlimited. Um, I'm looking at this as a long game. So, yeah. yeah. So the Kickstarter project was is a, was a sort of separate seed of money that you could use for a specific purpose or whatever you wanted to, to do, yeah. or even to start funding ads campaigns. But you should also be looking yeah. at the whole Amazon platform and, and other retailers if you're wide platform as well in the same way almost regardless of the fact that you, you had a successful kickstarter project i think so and i think kickstarter is just another <clears throat> another avenue for marketing um, one that's not particularly uh very often used and um and that's unfortunate and i think there's going to be a movement towards doing it more often for fiction in fact there's now a uh, and i'm going to do a plug here it's not for my own course but um uh, dean wesley smith and uh, christine catherine rush are actually offering a free course right now on fiction uh, Kickstarters. And the reason that I'm happy to recommend Dean's course uh, is because I actually emailed him during during the course of my of my Kickstarter. And those of you who don't know, Dean and, and Chris are basically sort of a certain st- a certain kind of standard bearer in the indie movement. They're they're um, they offer like, excellent educational opportunities uh, both online and in person. And they're they've both published over 75 novels. They're sort of they're sort of what everybody should try to become yeah, yeah. You know, in a lot of ways. But uh, I emailed him with the with the link to my Kickstarter when it was active, and he said that it was one of the best Kickstarters that he'd ever seen. Um, so he um, is a really good uh, resource for this because he knows what he's talking about. They've funded over ten Kickstarters of their of their own, so that's happening right now. So it's a good time actually. Um, in fact, I only found this. Um, course this morning it was only uh, announced early uh, late last week so it's a good time to start looking into this as a, as a potential avenue and was this different uh, genres or is this all epic fantasy no this is fiction okay yeah just whatever yeah, no, abs- so yeah. it could be romance and, thrillers absolutely okay absolutely yeah. okay and your um your project which i'm sort of would like to see now but i guess it's down now because it's funded or mm-hmm. is it still there at a it's it's still there. The if you, link you send us the link, we'll include the link in the show notes for yeah. this episode so people can have a look at what that. we're talking about. So one thing you mentioned, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, is the video. Yeah. So you have to have a video with a Kickstarter project or is it an optional extra? You, you don't have to. It's optional. But, okay. it, but it's much harder to fund if you don't have one because we're, let's face it, we're a, we're a video-based culture. <laughs> yeah. We're, so uh, no, it's, it's actually important. And there are a few... Uh, sort of do's and don'ts that I could talk about specifically that might be helpful for anybody who's interested. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Basically, uh, you want to do your research and and see what other people are doing, but do it with kind of uh, a bit of discernment. Because if you look at somebody like uh, Michael J. Sullivan, who is extremely successful in Kickstarter, he basically funds most of his books with, you know, several, several, you know, multi six figure um, funding, Kickstarters and everybody knows him as the Kickstarter guy. Uh, so he does videos that are basically he can do anything. He can just turn on the video, talk to the camera. He can say stupid things and everybody will still buy it because he is who he is. So for most of us, that's, you know, we don't have the personality uh, or the uh, uh, people don't know us yet. There, there are some things you probably should keep in mind. One is that people's attention span is extremely short. So if you can keep your video under one minute, that would be better. And the other thing that you really want to do is you want to structure your video 
uh, like the hero's journey. So, but again, the hero is not you, but the reader. So you need to have um, basically six elements to your video and only one or two sentences for each of the elements. You start with a hook and the hook is gonna be um, unique to your project. And in my case, the hook was the idea that wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be interesting for you to take part in the creation of a novel? Um, and it was a kind of an unexpected hook, not one that, that people were um, had seen a lot of, so it worked well for me. Um, you follow the hook with a, with a setup, and that setup is like you introducing yourself as the sort of uh, mentor, the Gandalf figure. Like, I'm here and I'm going to take you on this journey. Um, and you need to make that as interesting and as exciting as possible because what you follow with is the problem. And the problem is always going to be the same, which is I don't have enough money to do this on my own. And this is the scariest and the most difficult bit because you have to phrase it in a way that doesn't turn people off. So you will have to have given them an interesting enough hook and an exciting enough setup so that they can sort of grin and bear it through the struggle because you want to carry them through the problem and the struggle where you explain why Kickstarter is what it is and why, why it's a good thing and why it isn't a platform for charity, but it's a platform for pre-orders. You have to stress that a lot. And then you provide them with a solution, which is that we together are going on this journey where you are going to receive that, which I promise. And uh, that can be different depending on the genre. Most of the time you're focusing specifically on, on entertainment value. And, and you end with a specific call to action and that call to action has to be as specific as, so big, make sure to grab a copy of book title now in the sidebar and you point at the sidebar for however many dollars. So you're, you're specifically telling them to go to one of the tiers uh, and the tiers can go from $2 to infinity, but you want to pick the one that's most appealing and the one that gives the best value. So I pointed them towards the $20 one. And knowing that if they were interested enough to look at that, they would keep scrolling and yeah. maybe the $100 one would interest them, which is what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm scrolling. I found the page. In fact, if I just Google Kickstarter, yeah. Nick Kotar, it came up. And uh, yeah, yeah, so it's very interesting. You're, I see what you mean about the entry level one. $5 for all three eBooks is a is yeah. a good price and would keep people interested on the page. And I guess once people, it's that thing, is it? once people have decided that they're going to be a part of this, yeah, I'm already scrolling down. Well, I'm going to buy it. I may as well go for something that's going to give me a, well, who knows, a shot at that sword. There's the $100 one I'm seeing now. And there was 150 Now, And something that's been answered here, looking at the page, I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. and I would have guessed a higher number. It's actually the total number of backers is lower than I thought it was going to be. So you made $25,798 yeah. from just 776 backers. I say just, yeah. that's a hell of an achievement, but... <laughs> I kind of thought it was going to be a thousand backers at five at five dollars. I think well, my maths aren't good, but um, yeah. but yeah, that's only seven hundred seventy six. Well, that's the thing. Most people think that you're going to get the vast majority of your supporters at a lower tier. That's not necessarily the case. It's, and it's much more basically in, in all crowdfunding, you want to find a sweet spot that isn't too low, but that isn't high enough that's going to scare people. So that's why I made the hard sell for the twenty dollar one, knowing that there would be perhaps other incentives to push them higher up. Yeah, and your average sale was over thirty dollars. Your yeah. average backer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I had a few five. I had a few five hundred dollar ones also, and uh, which helped. <laughs> as we're doing the interview, I'm not going to click on this now. But if we click on the main picture, is that is that where you get the video from? Um, it would have been. Yeah, so I can see it's kind of the play thing here, just so people know how to. Uh, yeah, it's there. It's there. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. And there is a bit of this going on at the moment, as you say, you've alluded to uh, a few people are using Kickstarter. Um, I, I think we should reiterate again that you only go into this and do this with a 100% guarantee to yourself that you are going to deliver what you're promising because this will very quickly get a very bad rep with the, uh, yes. the reading public and the backing public if too many authors yeah. spoil the fun for everyone else. So Exactly, so, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's does happen in any online business you will get some bad actors um yep. but yeah let's make sure we're not we're not them um great well it's really fascinating actually uh, a new a new stream of income i think a lot of the rest of this year is going to be about diversification of income yeah yep. um and not necessarily relying on your employer or, or on any one source of income but having different ways of doing things and yep. uh, people are going to spend a bit more time at home and on digital environments and so this sort of ticks a lot of those boxes i think well, and not only that, it also ticks the box of community building. And I think that for as much as people are going to be talking about social distancing, 
what what people are not talking about, but what people really want is to make up for that community that they're going to be missing out on because they're no longer, you know, going to public places as often. And, you know, so often we get so negative about social media and about the the virtual aspect of online communities. But now more than ever before, this is a real advantage because people are going to be looking specifically for that. So if you can really um, focus on that aspect of it. And really for me, this was the reason, you know, one of the reasons why it was successful is because uh, I made sure to do a lot of preliminary uh, communication with people one-on-one to tell them that I was going to do this. Um, So it wasn't me just waiting for uh, this this thing to launch and then to start looking for people. I tried to build the community in advance. And what that did is that on day three of, of the launch, no, sorry, within one day, within 24 hours of the launch, I had actually already funded and then what Kickstarter did is that they they did me a favor and they they made it into one of the projects that they love. Right. And so this is why this is how Kickstarter is better than a lot of the other um, platforms is that it has its own internal system that if you manage to trigger it, you get a tremendous boost. And okay. I'll tell you, seventy five percent of my uh, backers came internally from Kickstarter itself. Yeah, so that's one area we haven't specifically talked about is how you marketed and raised visibility yeah. of this project. But obviously, it's a bit like the Amazon algorithm. If you can get things going yourself, the yeah. algorithm will start to help you. Yeah, and to do that, you have to have a lot of initial support. So there there are a few numbers that you can talk about. One of them is if you can reach 40% within the first week, you're almost guaranteed to fund. Uh, and the other one is you if you can uh, get people to commit verbally to... 40% before you begin, then that is a good indicator that you're going to be able to do this well and that you're probably going to uh, fund it. Because Kickstarter, unlike the other ones, if you don't fund completely, you don't get any of it. Yeah. So that's the risk. Yeah. But they have, but the risk is worth the reward if you're able to get the algorithms on your side. And where did you find your initial backers then? Is this your mailing list or? So, so I started with my mailing list, but, and this is the weird thing, it was almost entirely due to personal messaging on Facebook. So because most of the time people tell you, you know, David Gogren and other people like this tell you, do not market your books to your own family and friends because they're going to mess up your also bots, right? This is the exact opposite. You want to, to find every single person you know on every single social network that you can find. Message them personally and tell them about what you're doing. Because if you send a mass mailing, they won't, yeah. there's no incentive to answer you. But, and some of, some of my friends didn't answer also. I mean, I didn't, I didn't get a perfect 100% answer rate. But because I wasn't worried about messing up the also bots, it meant that I could look, uh, that I could go after people that weren't normally my reader. And for the initial 40%, that's fine. You don't need to have readers in your genre. You just need to have readers who are willing yeah. to put up the money. They might not even read your book. Or it just, doesn't matter. Or just friends who want to support your project, yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And if you have enough of those, um, and so I made sure that I had enough promised that it would be able to cover the 40. And then I asked them specifically, you know, support me within this time period. And I was pretty active in the, during the first 24 hours, reminding people and, and getting them excited and making sure to focus on the community building aspect of it. And because of that, it shot up through the gate, through the gate immediately and you just kept going. Like a virus taking hold in the population. <laughs> that kind of, uh, that kind of. I, I didn't want to go there. No, no. <laughs> We can, we've got to keep laughing, otherwise we're just going to stop. No, okay. it's, it's true. It's true. Okay. Well, look, look, that's brilliant. We've had, we've had a fantastic uh, chat about this. I've, of course, been bombarded with messages. I'm sorry if I looked a bit distracted in the middle of that. No, no, you're, you're fine. But, <laughs> but it's been gripping, and I think people are all ears for different avenues of marketing as things unfold and become, you know, in a couple of years' time, this could be a very mainstream thing that authors do. But at the moment, it's an outlying thing, and that's where we want our audience, the audience of this podcast, is where we want them to be. So... Yeah. Uh, at the beginning of those curves ahead of those curves fantastic yeah. Nick great pleasure to talk to you um, thank you you too James yeah. hunker down as we're all going to yeah. do now let's uh, let's yeah. see you on the other side and we'll, um, we'll hear about your next thing whatever it is uh, in the future thank you James this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer there we go, Nick Kotar, really interesting experience there. And as he said, his, uh, his GoFund, I don't know if it was GoFundMe, I can't remember now, having done the interview, but whichever site it is, it's mentioned in the interview and it's still there. So you can see all those tears he gave out and the comments he got back and all the rest of it. I mean, crowdfunding is suddenly 
I mean, it's been around for a few years. I've used it a couple of times in other projects outside of, uh, of SPF, my local cricket club. This year, actually, we've had our finances saved from using a crowdfunding campaign because without cricket, without social events, without subs and match fees, we have no money coming in and all the bills still going out. And we needed uh, not very much, but we needed £5,000 to survive uh, this COVID period. I stuck a, I used crowdfunding and we've raised that money in about two and a half weeks, uh, which is fantastic. So crowdfunding is being used all over the place at the moment. Uh, there's a very ancient soldier in the UK called Captain Tom who walks with a Zimmer frame. Colonel Tom. Colonel Tom. Is he a colonel? No, he's captain, isn't he? No, he got he got he was given an honorary. Oh, he's, uh, he's now a colonel, sorry, sir. Um who's raised something like twenty five million pounds. Keep keep going. More than that, forty odd million. Forty million. 40 mm. odd million pounds uh, through crowdfunding. So there is, you know, that's an example. Walking around his garden. Walking around his garden for the British. I can do that. For the UK NHS. Um, yeah, just about. Uh, but it just goes to show that the crowdfunding is a billion dollar turnover business. And it is perhaps something we should be thinking about. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we, we, we thinking about Kickstarter for a comic project that I'm doing with my brother at the moment. So the Beatrix books, we, we may look at doing a, a Kickstarter for those potentially. So it's, it's a big, uh, it's a definitely a big, interesting industry. And I've had some good interviews actually with, um, the six figure author podcast had a good interview with, um, I don't know who it was now, but someone who, who did very well with, with Kickstarters. And I've, I've also seen, I won't no, name names here, but I have seen some um, authors, or one in particular, who was kicked off Amazon for being a bit naughty with regards to, well, some alleged um, nefarious behaviour. Um, and he um, he moved over to Kickstarter. He's got lots of fans, and he was able, I think he's able to like, generate sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 for every book that he launches. So he actually has used that now to sidestep Amazon doesn't need to use them to distribute anymore. He's probably making more money as well because he, he, he'll be getting more than, you know, mm. the Kickstarter angle will be less than the 30% he's giving to Amazon um, in terms of the royalty. So probably making more money. So it's, it's just another, it's another way to reach a different community of people who'd be interested in your stuff. So uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's definitely an interesting growth area. Yes, of course, Kickstarter was the uh, platform he used, which has slightly different rules from some of the other crowdfunding, which uh, Nick does explain in the interview. Good. Well, it's all uh, all interesting area of the uh, sort of digital landscape that's ahead of us now. There are nooks and crannies all over the place and definitely something to think about. Maybe it's the sort of thing that authors could, who collaborate um, could do. I was thinking about the billionaire women, uh, the brilliant uh, four authors uh, who put together that that reverse billionaire series. That's the sort of thing I could imagine their fans would would pay for on Kickstarter and feel a part of and get some special bundles uh, when it comes out. Sort of thing would lend itself to just uh, a chance to use your imagination about that. Good. Okay. Quick reminder: if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash six secrets, S I X. S-E-C-R-E-T-S. You can sign up for that exciting Amazon Ads webinar with the one and only Janet Margot in the beginning of June. It's going to fill up, so you will have to be there early. I think that's it, Mark. You can go back to the garden and uh, try and tackle Samuel again, try and, try and get some um, revenge. Yeah, I'm going to do a Boris John Johnson yeah. two-footed challenge. <laughs> two-footed challenge. Do you think Boris Johnson... It's actually worth... <laughs> it's worth it. People should probably look that up. If you yeah. do Boris Johnson and rugby and child, it's, it's probably worth it's worth well, seeing it's that. It's not he, just he, rugby. He, he also did a very similar football. rugby tackle in a football game as well. I don't think he really... He did a, two, he did a two-footed tackle <laughs> on, on Frank Lampard or someone. Yeah, someone like that. So he is basically... Um, a bit of a thug. Anyway, that's He's our a liability uh, on the uh, sports yes. pitch. That's it. Okay. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. All that leaves me to say is that it's been uh, a great show. Thank you for joining us. I think it's been a great show. I say that myself. Uh, and it's a goodbye from him. And it's a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.